All righty. Okay, we're in law and grace class, but there's really law and lamb. And um, we've been, since uh, last class, we've been going through pictures and stories and parables and things that really, maybe we never really noticed the real heart behind those pictures and the real emphasis on the lamb because we're so busy with our doctrinal view of law and grace and and how it's about um, uh, uh, doing things right and uh, pleasing the Lord through being good Christians and things like that instead of really finding his heart and, and, and Lord willing we've been able to see his heart in some of these uh, factors. I'd like for you to turn with me to John chapter 2 and I want to take another look with another little story here. <clears throat> uh, John chapter 2. And um, <clears throat> some of you have heard me share on this, I'm sure, just about every scripture, one time or another. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give this one a little bit different angle. And I have shared a few of these things before. But I want to I give it a little bit different angle so that we can see the true lamb in this thing. This is John chapter 2. And... Right now, we'll just do 14 through 16. I guess we better start at 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables and he said unto them that sold doves take these things from here make not my father's house and house of merchandise <clears throat> all right and so um the story is uh in a certain sense uh free will um but it's free will um, with freedom from the cross or free will with choosing Christ and the altar. And, you know, to God, having free will is, is an important thing, but it's not the most important thing. I mean, Jesus, Jesus showed what the most important thing was when he said, not my will, but thine be done. And what he meant, he could have just as well said, not my free will, but the altar because that's what he's talking about. He's going to go to the cross. Not my free will. And that doesn't mean that he really didn't have free will. It means with his free will, he chose the altar. Okay, so it doesn't remove free will. It, it actually proves it. Um, and I'm sure some of y'all have experienced this where, where people have said to you, well, you know, you know all y'all do is talk about death and all you talk about you know, laying down your life and all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and um, you know, you, you're just under the law and you could be free. You could be free to live happy and da 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 da. And, you know, from my understanding of, of this body and this Bible school and this church is that we've chosen this. We've chosen this. We didn't have to. We didn't. And, and I've always said over the years, I, I don't think I've said it in a little while, but I've always said over the years, if it's not coming by life, then this place is torture. Don't stay. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it's the best choice. But if, it's by, if, if you see the Lord in this and you understand this by his life, then, then you have the freedom to choose that just like they have the freedom not to choose that. <clears throat> so, uh, Jesus let the doves loose with freedom to fly. Jesus came in there and he released the doves. And didn't, isn't it interesting that verse 16 only identifies the doves? And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from here and make not mine house 
my father's house a house of merchandise. <clears throat> um, Jesus let the doves loose with freedom to fly. He came in there and he gave those doves free will. Right? Okay. These were not altar doves. They weren't. I mean, they, yes, they would have been sacrificed because somebody bought them from some merchandise dealer. You know, like, like Jesus, when he was dedicated, Mary and Joseph brought two turtle doves to dedicate that little guy. You know? And they were dedicated, those doves were dedicated, they were, they were chosen for that. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure I'll say it here, but for these guys, they just got doves and chose them to make them rich, to make them better off, to make them increase, to make them prosper. See, that was their goal. That was their heart. And so there was no, no uh, uh, taking your own doves, taking something that is yours and offering it up and saying, you know, I mean, Deb and I have done this most of our marriage, but it's like, you know, whatever we have is, is there to be offered up unto God. It's really not ours. And so, you know, just like I think that those families, you know, they had sheep and goats and, and this and that, but everything that they had could be offered to the Lord because that's the kind of relationship they had with God. <clears throat> so um, these doves were not altar doves. The money changers had not had these willing offerings brought to them, but just gathered them to sell. They, uh, the money changers did what they did for gain only. The doves had not dedicated themselves to the altar, but probably longed for freedom. And I'm saying this in, in this manner. Birds have wings. And what a joy. I mean, God gave them wings, and God gave us free will. And free will is a form of wings. I mean, it really is. You, you don't... You can fly away, you know? And, um, but these doves were captured and they were put in cages and they were put there uh, because their free will was taken away and Jesus comes in and sets them free, okay? <clears throat> There's more to it than that but because free will is not the end and I, I said that already. Um, uh, the doves had not dedicated themselves to the altar but probably longed for freedom so Jesus gave it to them Jesus gave it you know he could have preached a sermon to them <laughs> you know okay guys listen I'm not going to let you go because that's what we're about here about death and dying and it's all about the worst of everything you know he didn't, he didn't preach that he let him go and just so you know that's a big deal to me as a pastor <clears throat> it's a big deal it's a huge deal to me uh, I never want to violate somebody's will now, I'm not perfect, so I'm sure I have, but I've never, from, for years and years and years now, not done that. I have, and in ways that you would never know because you were never there or whatever, I have set people free when I felt like they were in bondage instead of having this spirit in this nature. I've set them free, and I've done it to a lot of people because that's the Lord to do that, okay? And along with that comes that we should never have an attitude of, well, you know, this is, this is what it's all about and that they, they're less than us because they're, cause that's not the truth. We should honor where their will is and, uh, you know, and respect their free will. 
by the same token, we should, we should hope that someone would respect our free will to choose the Lord in, the, in this manner as, as the lamb. We would hope that. It doesn't happen as much, but that doesn't matter either. The only thing that matters is that we walk in his spirit towards people. All of it depend on where they're at based on their free will. All right, so Jesus did let them go. <clears throat> um, they longed for freedom, so Jesus gave it to them. Jesus will set the captives free, right? But we must choose if we are willing to be willing sacrifices or not. Because that's, that's a fact. I was sharing with somebody <clears throat> that reality that I saw one day. It seemed like Jesus, when he came, he was so loving and gentle and the way that he, he was in so many ways and, and things like that. And it was like he's setting the, I came to set the captive free and I heal these people. I feed all of this and just didn't, you know, wasn't demanding so much. But then Paul comes along and Paul goes, we need to lay down our lives. And John says, by this pursuit, we the love of God. He laid down our, you know, and Paul goes, you know, for you're dead. And, you know, you're just going, you know, somebody could look at that and go, gosh, those guys are a lot meaner than Jesus, you know. But you see, Jesus isn't going to declare all of that about himself for himself. He's going to give you freedom. He's going to set the captives free. Paul's the one who comes along and quotes, you know, that, that he hath, uh, what is it, set, made captivity captive. The, ca the captives have been set free and made captives again. And now we're captives to Jesus in our heart. We're bond slaves. But we chose that. We chose that. <clears throat> um, so Jesus will set the captives free, but we must choose if we are to be willing sacrifices or not. And of course it says that, you know, the, um, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. Um, <clears throat> they must now choose the freedom that is actually nothing short of independence. They choose freedom, which is really no, and nothing short of independence, or they must choose the freedom to return back to Jesus and from there go to the altar. Okay, so I'll explain that a little more. But I'm seeing that in terms of, a, of, of doves that were set free. So all these doves have been set free. You can look at it the same as the uh, ten lepers and they're set free. Go and, you know, and as they went, they were healed and then they, they went and they were set free they were independent they they found their independence and they we don't know what happened to them and there's no condemnation in the scriptures in relationship to that but jesus seemed to be surprised when one returned to him you know and he did that out of free will that wasn't required and jesus never even mentioned that you should do that see that's the spirit that we're talking about here, where something in you says, you know, Jesus, you, you gave yourself, you laid down your life, and I want to be partaker of that nature. I want to, first of all, thank you, because I recognize your spirit. That's right. You know? <clears throat> so, so I'm going to read this last part again because there's a progression that happens here. Um, they must now choose the freedom that is actually nothing short of independence, or they must choose the freedom to return back to Jesus and from there go to the altar. The progression is never that of going directly from independence to the altar. Okay, so let's, you know, let's just spell that out there. Okay, independence is, you know... Wings, we've been given wings, you know, and, and Jesus set us free so that we can fly. And then there is uh, Jesus, and then there is the altar, and I guess I should do this a little different man, shouldn't I? Try to make this 
uh, altar here. So there's wings and Jesus and the altar, and and they can be like a butterfly in the sense that they're free, they're independent now, but there's a progression for coming back. And we would think that maybe that progression is, okay, Jesus, you were a lamb, you went to the altar, so I'm going to go to the altar also. But it's never the right order. The right order is always from independence to Jesus, from Jesus to the altar, from independence to Jesus, and from Jesus, the altar. In other words, the altar is not preeminent. It is something his life produces, but it is not the goal. Neither is death, neither is selflessness, neither is, it's Christ, and it all comes from him, and if it's not him, then we're doing kind of some of the stuff we talked about last class, where we're just being kind to people and this and that, but it's still us. And if the, if the father's looking for his son, then we've, we failed that, Mark. And if Jesus is looking for those after his kind, if he's looking for sheep, then we fail that because we're still not out from him. Uh, um, it, it says in the book of Revelation, it says uh, he is the beginning and the end. And the word beginning there <clears throat> means two things. It means the source and it means the, the power that brings it about. Okay. Yes. Right. And so we have to go because only Christ can go to the altar. Right, and I'll explain it a little more, but yes, that's, and, and Christ in us, but yes. Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> um, and so for Jesus to be the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the, to be that beginning is also the end. It is, he is the source of it that starts it, and he is the impetus or the force and the power that carries it and brings it to pass, whereby he is also the end. So, <clears throat> so what that means is we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to find Jesus. We're gonna have to find him in relationship to those things that the altar calls for, but without, without overemphasizing the altar above him, the lamb. See? And that's, that may sound simple, but it's, it's huge. It really is, it's huge. So, so I think I spelled it out a little bit here. Hopefully this, this also mm -hmm. helps. The progression is never that of going directly from independence to the altar. First, they must return unto Jesus. They do so in order. In other words, they're, they're doing this with purpose. They do so in order to partake of his mind. Because if you don't partake of his mind, you may agree with everything that we teach around here, or the, we're not the only ones who teach this, other places. You may agree with that, but there will always be struggles. There will always be pulls. But there's no, see, there's no pull in the mind of Christ. There is no pull in his mind. Let this mind be in you, which was all, it's, it, he knows what he came for. He knows what it's about. The, Paul says we bear about in our bodies. This is not something that we will do or did or have already done. We bear about now in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. And that's with purpose. Number one, to manifest Christ. Number two, the, in weakness we find the power of God that changes things. And that's... That's a tough one for some to comprehend, to swallow, because it's a completely different kind of power. But it is the power of God. <clears throat> All right, so then, um, 
They do so in order to partake of his mind. Once that is done, then they will choose the altar based upon both free will and upon having gained his mind. You see the two things there? Free will. Now, guess what? You, you have free will and you have, in, I'm going to say it like this, you have independence, meaning you have the right of choice and you choose to use your free will for the altar in conjunction with the mind of Christ. So, and if there's not free will that first approaches Jesus, then you'll never get the mind of Christ. Then you're just agreeing with, like, you're just agreeing with an altar and you're not agreeing with the spirit of selfless in that altar. Yes? And two, two sides to that, to that also. To reckon yourself dead in, the, in Romans uh, 6 is, and 7 is dealing with um, the finished work of the cross. Um, many times when we talk about the altar for us, it is the work of the nature of Christ in us. Um, and therefore reckoning doesn't really apply to that the mind of Christ will bring that about but but what well, what you said is right and that is free will or to want to live or whatever will happen until that that cross and we've acknowledged our death with him and then we've chosen that death we also choose this nature, which really shouldn't have, a, if I could draw a decent lamb here, but we'll just put the cross on the inside of Jesus as the lamb. To choose this death will cause us to choose him to self-give in us, which is considered an altar. It's more of an acknowledging that you're dead than it is trying to put yourself to bed. Yeah, Scott? This bit makes me think of the love slave, you know, the free will, the coming back and being perished. Right. Yeah, and, and, and in that, it's probably here is all the cross, here's the piercing, but then there has to be a, because he says, I love the master. So now he's going to live that out. The rest of his life. The piercing was the initial work of the cross. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool some of this stuff. If you can really, like you're doing, Carol, if you can really divide these things out, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense when we're, you know, because our minds, are, you know, we say, let this mind be in you, and you go, well, I'm trying to let the thoughts be in you. Well, but I can say, let these thoughts, you know. I remember I was one day something reading it, and I said, oh my God, this doesn't say let Jesus' brain be in us. You know, this is the way that he thinks, his mindset or his attitudes in his, the way of proceeding. <clears throat> All right, so first they, re they must return unto Jesus. They do so in order to partake of his mind. Once that is done, then they will choose the altar based upon both free will and upon having gained his mind. <clears throat> this can be applied to us spiritually also. So this, in other words, this is maybe theological uh, or maybe, but it's also spiritual to us. <clears throat> so I wrote, my religious selfish will would be changed by the contrast of myself having Jesus revealed in my core. In other words, 
the, the core, see, to know that the old man is dead is one thing, but the core of selfishness, um, only the life and nature of Christ in his selflessness can change that. That's all. There's nothing else that can do that. No doctrine of the cross. No, it's not, it's just not going to do it. <clears throat> um, and that's why the scriptures not only talk about, you know, what's true in Jesus 2,000 years ago or the finished work of the cross or those things. It talks about our walk, to walk in him, not just to walk with him. All right, so um, he entered the temple of my soul. So here's, here's what I wrote. The, uh, my religious selfish will would be changed by the contrast of myself with having Jesus revealed in my core. He entered the temple of my soul and beheld my money changers and my false offerings. By his look alone came shame, brokenness, and a new awareness of my shallowness and great need. He signified to me that my being was his temple, and he began setting things in a manner that suited him. He communicated to me that he would remove everything that conspires against us, against his and our union. Then, just by his presence, there began a change in the order of my understanding as he overthrew all that was not of him. I'm sure y'all got all that with that. <laughs> I'm sure you got that. All right, I'll try to read a little slower this time. Sorry. It's just that that's, this comes from something very dear to me, and so it's like, all right, here we go. This can be applied spiritually also. My religious, selfish will would be changed by the contrast of myself with having Jesus revealed in my core. He entered the temple of my soul and beheld my money changers and my false offerings. By his look alone came shame, brokenness, and a new awareness of my shallowness and great need. He signified to me that my being was his temple. And he began setting things in a manner that suited him. He communicated to me that he would remove everything that conspires against us, against his and our union. Then, just by his presence, there began a change in the order of my understanding as he overthrew all that was not of him. Um, hallelujah, you know, gosh, you know, uh, you know, there, there just comes a day when the scriptures quit being just scriptures and stories and you, we become that story, you know, I mean, and it's no longer about learning a scripture and learning the moral of it or whatever, all of a sudden, like in this situation, it's like, like one day you see Jesus in a way that even if you're not even thinking about the money changer story, you see Jesus in a way where, like I said, the first it's the contrast. It's always the contrast first. But that contrast is necessary. It breaks us down. And it, and it, and it uh, what was the words that I used? It, it, uh, 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 He, by his look alone came shame, brokenness, and a new awareness of my shallowness and great need. That, that can't come except by a contrast. If, if we're just contrasting with ourselves with one another and all this kind of stuff, oh, we'll go through some stuff and whatever, but, you know, we don't think we're that bad. <laughs> I mean, none of us do until you... Look at him, and then you go, oh, my God, look how shallow I really am. Look how empty I really am. And, yeah, there's, there's shame. I mean, it should be shame. Amen? I mean, that, it's not only shame. It's not just shame. It's mixed in there with brokenness and a, awareness of, of the great need, but, but realizing that the great answer is also being revealed to me at this moment. And that that's my hope if, that, if this didn't happen up to this point because everything else hadn't come yet up to this point. 
then I would not know how much I needed Jesus. So all of a sudden, you're that story. And Jesus now no longer is a contrast to you. Jesus is now entering your core. He's entering your temp the temple of your soul. How, how was that? He entered this, the temple of my soul and beheld my money changers and my false offerings. And you go, oh my God, I really meant this for your glory. I mean, maybe they didn't, but I did. I mean, I, I did. I was trying to serve him the best way that I know how. And I sought to, to you know, to offer to him. Only that contrast again, and yet, and yet he's communicating something to me. Your mind, he's not just condemning, you know, he's communicating. Your mind, and I'm going to possess you. I'm going to take you, take you as a bride, possess you as my, my temple. Um, you know, how many different ways can you say that? And, and, um, and you know, in the book of Revelation, it says, it's, he said uh, that the, that the great red dragon made war against the lamb and against his tabernacle, the place where he dwells. Not just his Christians, but his tabernacle, the place where he dwells. I, I hate that they're giving him a place on this earth. And he can live. He's still living. I thought I killed him. And he was in a rage. You know? And, and so... You know, the thing that, that, that frightens him the most is a mature Jesus. So he's sitting there waiting for the woman to give birth, and he's got his mouth open, and he's ready to destroy that child just like he killed all those babies. And, you know, uh, Herod killed all those babies trying to kill Jesus before he got big enough to have to fight a real battle. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the way he thinks. He didn't realize that that little baby and that weakness would continue. And Jesus would be worse than a little baby. He'd be weaker on that cross. And that that was his downfall. He didn't, he didn't get it. He, you know, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Anyway, so there is this, um, uh, this, uh, you know, it's not words. There's this communication of his heart that now is going to take you as his because that's what his plan always was and we began to we began to see oh this isn't just something i wanted yeah. <laughs> you know this is something that he's always wanted so there's a something the stress lets loose a little bit because yeah. you realize he's going to enter in to the to my temple, that, and he's going to take care of this stuff, and and part of that is the revelation of how he took care of it at the cross, but it's the application so that we understand it, we can see it, we can receive it, we can walk in it, and that's what he's doing. So, um, uh, by his look alone, shame da 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 da. Um, but then he signified to me that my being was his temple. And he began setting things in a manner that suited him. And it was cool because then he was doing things um, that I didn't even understand. Yeah. Say, so, well, why did this happen? Because I would have normally looked at that as, you know, the example I gave on the blog thing was, you know, the disciples get in a the boat. They're trying to cross the water. The storm comes up. They're all afraid. Jesus comes walking on the water, but they don't see Jesus because he's veiled in the storm. They see something. They see someone, but they don't see Jesus yet because there's a storm and there's mist and there's fog and, and we're scared of the storm and, and all we can see is the storm and why is the storm here? And then it, then it adds to it because they don't yet see Jesus in the storm. They only see the storm, so they go, there. it's a spirit. It's a spirit. It's a, and they, that was a bad connotation that they used. This is a spirit. And they're all, they're freaked out even more. And Jesus has to say, hey, you know, he didn't go boom and, you know, make the clouds and everything go away and go, ta-da, it's me. 
he, he said, he spoke his word, and he said, fear not, it is I. Stop being afraid. I'm in this storm. I'm coming to you in this storm. Well, anyway, so I'm applying that to this where, you know, he starts overturning all this stuff and showing up all this stuff. This is, this is fake. You know, this is not in my spirit. You know, he starts doing all this stuff and you're just going, ah, this is an evil spirit. You know, so come, you know the storm and everything. And yet... And yet, if you, if you can perceive him, which I, I did at that point, I realized he's in control now. And he's going to do stuff that isn't comfortable. But with, see, because I saw, I saw his heart. And he was saying, what was the word? By his look alone, listen, no, he signified to me that being, that my being was his temple. And he began setting in order. And I, I, I got that. I got that. I didn't just get that God's dealing with me. Big difference. I got that. He said, look, I'm gonna, you're mine and I'm going to take you. And so I'm, I'm with him even while I'm freaking out. Because Jesus is in the storm. See? And once you recognize that you're with him, but you're still not crazy about the storm, you know. And then, um, and he communicated to me that he would remove everything that conspires against us. See, and that was what I, he communicated to me that he would remove everything that conspires against us, against his and our union, against us. And when he, when he communicated that, then I realized, oh, I'm not separate and in trouble or messed up. I mean, I, you know, we are, but I mean, I'm not, not in his heart, I'm not in trouble. Or, you know, you're really messed up and I've got to deal with you. None of that. It is like he is removing everything that's been conspiring against us and I didn't even know that I had stuff in me conspiring against the real lamb, the real dove. I didn't even know it. But he knew it, but he also knew you're mine. I have bought you. I bought you. And we go, well, you know, I'm a slave, so bring me out of the market, you know. But he's, he's bought and paid for us to be one with him. And in his heart, that's all that matters. It, it's all that matters. Everything he does, you know, we go, well, that's the savior, that's the healer, that's the da 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 da, that's all these. We divide, we chop Jesus up into little parts and, you know, dissect him and lay him out there and we go, oh, this must be the healer because he healed me. What if, it's, what, it's, what if it's the one who loves us and who has made up his mind that he's going to bring us into full oneness with him in his heart and everything he does he does by love and it's motivated by that thing then it doesn't matter if it's healing or if it's uh, deliverance or if it's dealing with us it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it doesn't matter i don't know he would be better off if i didn't say oh my redeemer or this or that he would be better off if we just said my life, my Lord, my love, my whatever, whatever word you want to use, you know, but, but something of heart, you know, my lamb God. Now, that means big stuff to me. It wouldn't to most people. Or my, but, I mean, that's my God, and that's my life, and that's the one that I love. <clears throat> and, I, see, that's, see, now that's to me, that's what the alabaster box was about. She recognized what she loved, and what she loved was lamb life. And she responded to it. And that drew out his heart, because nobody had been responding to that. Everyone was calling him healer, and this, and that, and that, and that. And she had seen it. She'd come there for his burial, just to anoint him. You're the anointed. You're the Messiah. You're the Lamb of God. Anyway, okay, so let me finish this a little bit. And, uh, <clears throat> or maybe I did. Oh, so I was reading it for you. <laughs> oh, gosh, forgot. Um, 
he communicated to me that he would remove everything that conspires against us, against his and our union. Then, just by his presence, there began a change in the order of my understanding as he overthrew all that was not of him. And so he starts rearranging everything, giving new, what he doesn't throw out, he gives new definitions to. Now that's a fact, that's absolutely the truth. If he doesn't throw it out, don't hold on to it too tight because he's gonna redefine it. Everything in this new creation is different than this old creation. All of his different definitions are different. So he throws out a bunch of stuff, for sure, absolutely. But he keeps some things, but he says, you're using it wrong. You're mishandling. You know, Paul said, we don't mishandle the word of God anymore. We don't do it deceitfully. Not that you're evil or trying to, but Paul did. Saul of Tarsus did misuse it. And he says, we don't do that anymore. Um, and so, and the reason why is because he starts giving us his, de his definitions. He starts saying, this is what this really means. Mm -hmm. This is, and then we start seeing not a new definition. We see how that's connected to his being, mm -hmm. his heart. And that's really law and lamb. That's what's going on in this class. Yeah. We are seeing how these, how all these different subjects that seem so different and so unconnected are all connected and and breathed of life so that they can he can give a new definition to that story and a new definition to that one and a new one so that we end up seeing his heart we end up seeing him and we end up not trying to get away from the law or or put it down or 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 whatever we don't even we're not even concerned with that um, Jesus, when he walked, fulfilled the law, but he never once tried to keep the law. You just walk in what fulfills the law. You walk in the nature that fulfills the law. All of it's fulfilled in love God and love others. He, he couldn't have loved others more than going to the cross for us to the, that extent. And he couldn't love the Father more than to say, Father, I do this for you and for your glory because you love this nature. You love this spirit, you know. And then you see that in the stories we're talking where he goes and gets that lamb and he brings it back. And he goes, I'm so happy for this spirit. There's one more brought back in. And, and uh, over and over, the, the different stories we went through the last couple of classes, where you, it's undeniable the real heart behind those things the real heart but until he gets in there and starts throwing stuff out and redefining things we will like last class we will be a two-eyed creature instead of a, one with the lamb who is full of eyes and we will miss the little things our, our eyes are made to see the big things. When you look at a hawk or a, or a lion or something like that, man, they can see far where they see in, you know. We don't even see it, you know. We don't even see it. And so he's trying to change us from, from just being a two-eyed creature that's trying to, be, trying to be in the religion that God set up the second time <laughs> called the new covenant we are not about the old covenant or the new covenant which we call grace we're not about that in that sense we're about our covenant our marriage covenant with the lamb that's what's important that's what we care about that's what we will pursue and we'll do it to our dying day because we see in the end, we see this is what he always wanted, you know? Yes. I can just, I'll, I'll close with this, but I can just see in the book of Revelation where John is standing there and you know, you got the angel with the, one of the bowls of, of plagues and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, it doesn't say this, but what if, what if the lamb is sitting there and saying, hey, hey, I know you got all these 
plagues and stuff going on, but you know, you're my angel, you're my messenger, go over there and tell him about what's really important. I, I'd like him to see it. I'd like for him to see it. And he goes, well, what about these plagues? And he goes, we'll get to that. Just, <laughs> this is for those guys down there. He needs to see this. If you're gonna live down there, you're gonna live in all this junk. If you're gonna live here in my reality, this is what you need to be seeing. This is where the end goal is. All right, well, let's close. Father, we just ask you to continue to move by your spirit. And Lord, open, open the word so that we can see your open heart. Um, Lord, let the Holy Spirit, who is so faithful, let him have more sway in our in our searchings and in our hungerings. Let our hungering be replaced with the one that he gives us. And may our searching of the scripture be um, with much fear and trembling in a good way. Um, and may we always pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ, not just for our sake, but that for the joy of the Holy Spirit to be able to lift up Jesus, which he loves doing. He loves it. He loves it. He's come to declare Christ. And, and uh, that we ask you, Father, to allow him to move so that we can pray on his behalf too, that he would just be overjoyed with revealing Christ and that, that we, would, we would be a a part and a partaker and, and, our, and, our, and our prayers would be effectual for his blessing too. And Father, of course, that you would get your son out of all of this, that you would get your son out of us and that your joy would be fulfilled to have an increase of Christ and that Jesus' joy would be fulfilled in getting one after his kind to bring us in, to bring us in. We ask you to do that and beyond what we can even ask or think in Jesus' name. Amen.